Graveyards full of big, elaborate tombstones weren't always as common in Britain as they are today. For much of history, enduring memorials to the dead were the privilege of the upper classes and royalty. For the less wealthy, memorials made of less durable materials like wood were sometimes used, or smaller, unmarked stones were laid on the grave as a sign of remembrance. But by the late 1700s and early 1800s, you get what archaeologist Dr. Sarah Tarlow terms the gravestone boom. This was a time of general economic change, and more and more people were able to afford a grave marker made of stone. And so you see a proliferation of new styles and technologies around remembering the dead. And today we're going to take a look at everything you need to know about your typical British parish graveyard. My name is Di Davis, and welcome to Genial Cymru. One thing you'll notice about British graveyards is that most of the historical tombstones that survive today are from the Georgian and Victorian periods. As a genealogist, I've worked with hundreds of tombstones, mainly in the Lampeter region, and the oldest one I've worked with so far is from 1755, just over 250 years ago, and it commemorates the life of Mary Davis of Kesslan. While I don't have a photo of her gravestone, it probably looks something like these other ones, commemorating the landowning Weinvauer family in the nearby Llandui Brevi parish graveyard. A lot of these early stones were pretty simple. Their shapes and sizes varied based on the field stones found in the area, and you often find that the text was irregularly shaped and dominated the face of the stone. The stones might be even simpler than that, like this one which is sat next to the tombstone of my six times great-grandfather John Walters. All it says is WT A70 1791. Others had nothing but initials engraved on them, so in many cases it can be really tricky to figure out who the stone commemorates. With the tombstone boom, memorials became more complex thanks to a wave of technological advancement as artisans began to mass-produce tombstones to meet the needs of the population. So while you see a lot of simple, idiosyncratic stones in the 1700s, once you get to the 1800s you see a lot of ready-made, standardized stones in a range of styles that differ only in the text that's inscribed on them. So here's the stone of John and Anne Davis of Penrhyw, who passed away in 1888 and 1890 respectively. The stone is pretty complex, it has floral and geometric designs, and a book with a biblical verse. And now here's the stone of Thomas Davis of Cumbrevi, who died in 1884. The exact same stone, with the same designs, and the only difference being the text. And here's the tombstone of my three times great-grandfather's siblings, who died between 1864 and 1878. Again, exactly the same. But this technological advancement and the higher quality of the tombstones allowed for other forms of embellishment people commonly added biblical verses that were meaningful to them and their family. Other stones might have personal messages about the dead. In a bit of an exceptional case, one of my ancestors, David Davis of Neath, 16 years after the death of his wife, returned to her grave to personally inscribe on her stone in Latin. David Davis, Uxores Amatai, Insculta Maya 1829 beloved wife of David Davis, engraved May 1829. In Wales, it's also very common to find Anglin poetry on tombstones. Anglinion are poems written in a traditional Welsh poetic style, and tombstones regularly feature a favourite verse from one of the many bardic poetry books printed throughout the 19th century. In some cases, the family of the dead may have even commissioned a bard to write them a personalised verse. It's not only what was on the tombstone that mattered, but also where it was located. Because what you'll find is that these parish graveyards were divided up into family burial plots. The three tombstones here are for my four times great-grandparents, Anne and William Williams of Clute Coidor, and five of their children. And as you can see, the plot is bounded by a short stone curb. But beyond that boundary, there are even more family members. The tombstone off to the left is that of Elizabeth Worthington, William's sister, 
Next to her are their parents, Moses and Anne Williams, and behind them is Thomas Lloyd, William's maternal uncle. And on the other side are David and Mary Lloyd, William's maternal grandparents. So that's four generations of my family buried one next to the other. And this tradition is really common, especially when it comes to large, wealthier families. This particular family burial plot probably extended much further back in time, too. It's just that those older tombstones haven't survived, or they never existed in the first place. It's important to remember that the parish graveyards were often already very ancient by the 1800s. Some were medieval in origin or were built atop earlier Christian religious sites. And often there wasn't a lot of room to expand these graveyards, so graves were reused, the stones relocated, removed, or even reused in walkways and walls. In the old parish histories from the 19th and early 20th centuries, you sometimes find references to monuments that no longer exist today. Sir Samuel Rush Meyrick, an English scholar, toured Cardiganshire around 1800, and in the parish church at Cassan, he found and transcribed a tombstone dedicated to Sarah Davis of Bailey, who died in 1785, a daughter of Mary Davis of Cassan, who I mentioned earlier. But since Maydick's visit, the tombstone has disappeared. And that's because these parish churchyards were ever-changing to meet the needs of the parishioners. And it was just about everyone in the parish that was being buried there, even though the parish churches were associated with the Church of England. But you'll find Anglicans, Methodists, like my Williams ancestors, Baptists, Unitarians, all kinds buried together. And of course that caused tensions, which in the Victorian age boiled over into the Public Worship Regulation Act of 1874. The act officially made it illegal to practice non-Anglican religious rites in the parish graveyard. This posed such a problem because most nonconformist chapels didn't actually have graveyards. Like if you look at the 210 Wesleyan Methodist chapels across North Wales in 1871, only three of them had graveyards. And beyond the parish graveyard and the few chapel graveyards, other options were limited. It wasn't until the 1800s that large planned cemeteries began to be used in Britain and their reach was limited because they were mostly located near large urban settlements. This is a picture of Morriston Cemetery near Swansea, built in 1915. A lot of my family is buried there, and when I was younger, I was lucky enough to have my grampy walk me through to visit our family graves. Without a guide, I might have been lost, since the cemetery covers 38 acres and thousands of graves. This is much larger than most parish or chapel graveyards, where you might find fewer than even a hundred tombstones. So if you're doing your family history, fingers crossed that your ancestors were buried in one of those small graveyards. But if you are someone who's researching your ancestors, I guarantee you that figuring out where they were buried is the gateway to incredible information. If you want to support Welsh history and genealogy on YouTube, make sure to leave a like and a comment, as that lets YouTube know to share the video with others. And if you're interested in more, why not check out this video about one of Wales' oldest nonconformist congregations, and how chapels are the key to your family history. A quick thank you to my supporters on the newsletter, Lissa and White Light.